Hello, and welcome to Portals to the Past. I'm your host, Will Hickox of the Watkins Museum of History. Portals to the Past is a series of interviews with historical figures significant to the border region. This series is a partnership between Humanities Kansas, Freedom's Frontier and National Heritage Area, and the Watkins Museum of History. We have an exciting program lined up for today. It will be our great privilege to speak with famed aviation pioneer, Amelia Earhart, she's also a Kansan, in the year 1937. We'll start off with an introduction by Ms. Earhart, followed by some questions. We encourage you, the audience members, to get involved by posting questions for our guest in the Q&A feature. Please use only the Q&A feature and not the chat feature. We may not have time to address all your questions, but we'll do our best. Hello, Ms. Earhart. Hello, Mr. Hickox. Uh, could you start off by telling us a little about yourself? Absolutely. I'm happy to be here. I shouldn't be here. I should be up there. <laughs> We're leaving today. We're going to make our second attempt to fly around the world at the equator. Me and Mr. Noonan are leaving later today but I'm very excited to take the time to speak with all of you before I go. There are two reasons that I have fallen in love with this beautiful industry. One is just for the fun of it. <laughs> and then the other is that I think that women are especially adept at jobs in science, technology, and engineering. We have worked for millennia creating utility and turning it into beauty. That is a woman's work. And so we are specifically wonderfully set to work in the sciences. So I hope that by doing my work, I can inspire many other women and all people to get more involved in these wonderful industries. So we're leaving today. We originally a few months ago decided to go to head west and that wasn't successful so we're going to try again because the best way to do something is to just do it so we are going to then go now east around the globe we're very excited but all that being said i want to give you a little information about what got me here i know that if you're interested in this, you probably know some of my different accomplishments, so I won't bore you with those facts and details. I'll talk to you about my life in Kansas and my childhood and how I became inspired as a little girl to always be interested in soaring beyond the clouds. So I was born in Atchison, Kansas. I hear that most of you are from Kansas and Missouri. Very excited to see you. Um, we lived when I was younger with my grandparents, my best friend, my sister Muriel, who's a couple years younger than me, and I had a wonderfully ordinary childhood. We played outside. We were, <laughs> we were definitely tomboys, as we would say. Uh, it's a shame that we had to grow up in a time where we were still expected to behave like good little girls because we definitely weren't. There was, there was one day when we went to a state fair, we, we saw a roller coaster and came home immediately and began to convince our uncle to build a makeshift roller coaster ramp. And I got into a box and I slid all the way down. I swear that was the first time I knew I wanted to fly. I crashed, of course, but it was fantastic. I was just fine. My father was a railroad man. He was a lawyer for the railroad. So that also inspired a lot of our curiosity. We didn't stay anywhere for too long. We lived with my grandparents when we were younger. Then we lived in Des Moines, Iowa, Kansas City. I went to six high schools in <laughs> four years, finally graduating from High Park in Chicago. So it always gave us each other and a curiosity for travel, which I really appreciate. Um, we moved back and forth. That was, that was great. And then um, I went to Columbia uh, to study sciences. 
I had been obsessed with engineering. And so I went to study science and Muriel was in Toronto in school. And my mother and I went to go visit her. And when we went to go visit her, that's when I finally understood what the World War was. This was World War I. And we were there and there were all of these men in Toronto coming back with missing limbs. And I could see the pain. And I felt like if I went back to school, I would be useless. But if I could stay there, I could have purpose. So I left Columbia and I became a nurse's aide in Toronto. And I stayed there for a while and that was wonderful. Um, we went to an air show, my friends and I one time, and they were showing off how all the planes were flying. And there was one uh, young pilot who thought that he would scare us by flying really close down. And I swear that little red plane whispered something to me. I knew, I knew that I needed to fly. The first time I got to fly was in California. My family ended up in California and I went to stay with my family there once the war was over. And um, my first flight was with Frank Hawks, who was a famed pilot. And at the moment I was a hundred feet off the ground, I knew it was where I belonged. So I saved up money um, working a bunch of different jobs. Uh, I, <laughs> I drove a truck uh, with construction supplies. My mother wasn't super happy about that. Um, but I ended up saving up, it was $1,000 to buy my little plane. It was uh, Kinner Arister. Um, I painted her yellow, my canary. And so I started taking lessons with Netta Snook. Um, she was the first woman instructor to graduate uh, from the Curtis School of Aviation. She was amazing. And so I worked to fly and I flew and I worked. Um, some of the family helped me out every once in a while, but it was a lot of different odd jobs, um, wonderful things. And then I ended up having to, my father was sick. So we ended up having to sell my plane. Um, and I ended up moving back to the East Coast, to Boston. Um, my sister was working and teaching at Harvard. And I thought I might try that out. I ended up at um, a, a social house uh, where children and families, immigrant families would come to learn about American culture and um, we would educate them on how to speak English and different science classes and activities for the children projects. I really do love teaching. I don't think I will ever be a mother of my own, but I do love caring for children. So that was a wonderful experience and I was busy, 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 busy. Uh, <laughs> And then I sort of didn't get to fly as much. Um, it was always a hobby. Um, it was my activity. But um, so I took a break from that. Um, I stayed involved in different publications uh, and different um, aeronautical societies. Uh, when one day I remember I was shuffling the children to their classes. They were always like, Mrs. Earhart, Mrs. Earhart please, 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 I wanna to go to music today instead of, <laughs> instead of math. And I would always have to finagle them and talk to them <laughs> about the fact that they needed to go to the classes they signed up for. So you can imagine the pandemonium in the hallway between classes and then getting ready for dinner, feeding the children. And uh, a boy from the office came to me and he told me there was a phone call and I told him, I, I shoot him away and I said, no, 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 I'm too busy. But he finally convinced me that I needed to come to the office, that it was very important. And it was a gentleman asking me if I wanted to be the first woman to fly across the Atlantic. And I said, of course. 
So George Putnam um, had picked me because there was a woman who had funded this project, but ended up, lady guest, ended up um, not being able to do so. But she wanted it to be an American woman. So of course I agreed. There were three of us, pilot, navigator, and myself, who was the log keeper. It's funny, I really hoped that I would actually get to fly, but instead I was sort of just a sack of potatoes. But it was still an amazing experience. When we landed in England, I had no idea what was going to happen. But apparently, now I'm Lady Lindy. Do we look alike? Me and Mr. Lindbergh? <sighs> so that was the beginning. And from then on, I've had the luck to write for Cosmopolitan Magazine as the aviation specialist. I've been able to help and uh, promote different trans uh, different forms of commercial transportation. It was amazing. My favorite experience though, so far, is now I am teaching at Purdue. And it is a wonderful experience. As someone who's been to school twice and never finished, I appreciate the fact that they see my expertise. I get to live in the dorms with the young women, so I get to spend meals with them. Apparently, I've been getting them in a little bit of trouble. Uh, I like to put my elbows on the table and talk after dinner. Those are the best conversations. But, but apparently, it's not very ladylike. Their house mother told them that when they fly across the Atlantic on their own, they will get to put their elbows on the table. I think that's kind of unfair to them in general. Uh, I think we can talk about how I accidentally broke a barrier by just trying to take my plane up as high as I could get her, 14,000 feet. I didn't even know I was doing it. I was doing it just for the fun of it. But now I'm gonna do something new something wonderful. We're going to fly around the world at the equator. And I cannot wait to get back. And I hope that that inspires you to do something that you love, be it science, be it art. Best way to do it is to just do it. So I have to get going, Mr. Hickox. Let's ask some questions. Yes, I, I don't want to detain you for too long because you have a <laughs> mission ahead, but we do have quite a bit of interest from the audience. We're already starting to see questions, and I have some more questions as well. And I want to thank you for that wonderful and eloquent uh, introduction to your life. I would like to go back to your childhood, and we have an, a question from the audience from Jen who asks, how did your childhood home in Atchison on a bluff inspire you to fly? I love that question. Well, it was beautiful. I mean, my head was always in the sky, of course. Um, we, we had many hills around us, which was very fun. I don't know if you, my sister loves to tell this story. Uh, one year we got a brand new sled for Christmas and <laughs> we were sledding and I did what I like to call a belly slam down the hill. And as I was going down the hill on the road, there was a horse and carriage coming right in my way. And I slid right underneath both wheel spokes and came up unscathed. Luckily, it was so lovely. So yes, it was, it was an amazing place for us to grow up. And much to our grandmother's distaste, we did like to wear pants and run around up and down the hills for sure. That's great. Uh, you mentioned early on that uh, you suspected much of your audience is from Kansas and Missouri, which I think is correct. And you, you gave a very great uh, description of your childhood in Atchison. But I wonder, could you uh, 
let us know what other places from your life, uh, from your early life um, in this area can we visit um, in our own time of the 21st century? Oh, absolutely. Um, well, I, the story that I told about the roller coaster actually happened at the Iowa State Fair. So I would recommend going to the Iowa State Fair. Um, I also think that um, though it was a shorter time in Kansas City, we would stay there on holidays with my parents. There are many different interesting places in Kansas City you can go. Um, they have a World War I museum, uh, which you can find out sort of what my work was like as a World War I nurse's aide. So, and then there's a lot of information about the beginning of flying because it was harder for me and my colleagues to learn to fly because a lot of the men learned to fly through experience in the war, whereas we were not flying in the war as women. So it's a very interesting way to learn about all of that. Mm -hmm. uh how has being female affected your life and career? Uh, do you think you would have had other opportunities had you been male? I think that's a very interesting question. I think that it is important that I was a woman because that I am a woman in this, in this uh, life because I'm not always the most skilled, but my drive is to often be the first. And I think that as a woman, I get to be the first in a lot of aspects. I think that of course, things have been a little bit more difficult as far as uh, gaining experience, gaining hours of flying. Um, and I think that often people have thought that I was a little too outgoing I definitely have had some feedback at Purdue um, from some of the male students who don't like my effect on the female students because I am adamant that I sometimes don't think that my, my students should get married right away. Often their fiancés are older than them and as soon as their fiancés graduate, they want to get married. No. I want them to finish their degree before they get married. I think it's important. I very much love my husband, but he knows very much that my work comes first. I wore my wedding, wedding ring the day we got married, and now it just gets in the way. So these are my opinions. Excellent. We, uh, a number of people are taken with uh, your story of, of growing up in the Midwest and in Atchison. We have some questions from from Iaba, age seven, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly and I apologize if I'm not. Um, a, a question about, another question from, from Susan about um, Atchison. Uh, did you ever come back to visit in Atchison after you started flying? Oh, I don't remember if I've been back. Um, well, yes, because my grandparents' house was there. So yes, yes, yes. Um, but not, I, I've spent most of my time on the East Coast and in California. That's, that's where I've been mostly now. Um, I spent uh, more recently more time in New York. And so it's been much more coastal. But I do miss, I do miss the, the hometown. Hmm. Well, speaking of your varied accomplishments, we have a, um, an interesting question from uh, Aniston Kruger. Was Amelia really a fashion designer? Of course, you can speak about yourself in the first person. So were you really a fashion designer? Absolutely. We started a clothing line a couple of years ago. Um, it's part of my ambition to also continue the art of women's work. Um, I like to wear um, things that are utilitarian, things that I can work in. Um, when we first crossed in the friendship, when we first crossed the Atlantic, I got to England and all I had was my jacket and my flying clothes. And so all of these fashion designers were appalled and needed to give me all these dresses. I came home, I swear, with three trunks. It was very silly. 
Um, but yes, so I found that women have been very interested in the simplicity of what I like to wear and the functionality of it. So we started we started a clothing line for a little while. It's it's on a little bit of a hiatus now, but I'm hoping to get back to it soon. Interesting. Uh, well, you, you mentioned this briefly. Uh, we know that you were disappointed in not being allowed to take the controls during your transatlantic flight in the friendship. Uh, in what ways was this flight still a significant accomplishment, uh, personal or otherwise? Well, I, I, I do not want to sound ungrateful because I am very grateful to be the first woman who flew across the Atlantic regardless. Um, and I, from that came my first book, uh, GP, my husband, and I um, worked on uh, my first book, which is 20 hours and 40 minutes. I recommend you have the whole, I have the whole log in there and then a little bit more about myself if you want to read that. Um, so that was a great experience. And it was also just wonderful to be, to go through some of the different struggles. We got stuck a couple of times at the beginning um, and ended up going further north than we had planned originally. Um, but the people we met who were so supportive and going through some of these struggles, I think it really helped me prepare for my solo flight that I that was that was years later. So I think that was all very much a good experience for me in general. Excellent. Uh, we have sort of a uh, a classic interview question, you might say, from Lori. Um, and maybe I'll elaborate on it a bit. If you had to do it all over again, uh, what would you change about your life? Nothing. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> um, so what, um, what message would you like to give to women and girls in the audience? And I know from what I've seen of our audience and the questions that we do have quite a few women and girls in the audience. So what would you like to say to them? Find your passion, commit, don't give up, continue moving forward, no matter what. Work hard and know that you can. That's wonderful. And we have a, a more specific question along those lines from Catherine. Um, so I, I hate to have you repeat yourself, but if you could give a, a little bit more specific answer what did, to this question, what advice would you give to women who want to fly or transcend new barriers today? Oh, wonderful question. Um, study, uh, study and practice. Uh, if, you, if you find research, that's one of my biggest things as well, is um, I very much promote with my students that they do as much research as possible, and then also just go and do. Always just try, and if you fail, go back and do it again, because that is something that you should be committed to and care about if you truly, truly love it. You are intelligent and wonderful, and you can do anything. Hmm. Excellent. Uh, a number of people are interested to hear more about your upcoming trend, uh, flight around the world, and they want to get into the mechanics of it, but maybe I'll just ask, um, how did you and your co-pilot go about planning this expedition, and why are you going uh, along the equator, and why are you going in the direction that you are? Well, so we're going along the equator because it's the widest part of the earth. So we want to make that feat um, and we will be the first to do it. And um, our Lockheed Electra is the plane that um, very wonderfully with some uh, support from Purdue uh, with fundraising, we've been able to get this new plane and it has an incredibly wonderful um, new technology as far as the radio is concerned. It's like a laboratory inside. It's, it's wonderful. But unfortunately, when we went 
east to west originally, we ended up hitting the uh, one of the wings and having some issues. So for the last month or so, we've had um, had to have repairs on that, and we've had to save up a little bit of money to uh, repair that. So now we're with the wind speed, we're going to try and switch the direction, and we think it'll be more successful. Um, we're going to go California to Miami to the African coast. And then we're gonna continue going once we get through um, Asia and then back around to California again. So that's, that's the plan. And um, it's now it's just Mr. Noonan and I um, and me uh, because we had two other navigators as well um, who were going to assist, but unfortunately because of the time change, uh, this last month with the accident last month we uh they they're no longer available but mr noonan and i are confident that we can do it i'm sure you can uh so you are it's no secret to our audience that you are certainly a celebrity ms Earhart. and i wonder uh what is it like to be so famous and to be known as a as a as a pioneering female aviator? Um, are there aspects of fame that you don't like, or is it all just a blast? <laughs> you know, like a terrific experience. It's a tiring pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I don't get as much time to fly as I would like uh, because I am busy uh, speaking and and helping, um, but. Yes, uh, in general, it's always a pleasure. I love being an inspiration. That's great. Uh, so why don't I just ask one more question? We've got some great questions here. It's hard to choose from all of them. Uh, Carol asks, would like to know more about your sister. Uh, where is your sister now? And uh, what do you plan to do? She has an, a follow-up question. What do you plan to do when you come back from your trip? Oh, wonderful question. Um, rest is the first answer. <laughs> um, and I will probably write, I'm, I'm looking forward to writing another book that records um, our journey. So I am an avid writer. Uh, poetry was one of my favorite um, subjects. And so I still write a little bit, amateur poet. Um, so I will definitely record the entire journey and uh, write another book. And so that will be a big part of my time. My sister's a teacher and a mother um, and wife. And uh, she still has her wonderful, wonderful spirit. But she's very much chosen to become um, more sedentary than I, of course. Um, but she's an amazing mother and an amazing woman who helps spread um, female empowerment. She's great. Well, um, I, I can't resist asking this great question from an audience member. I wonder if I can bring it up again just so I can give them uh, credit here. Um, from Susan, uh, what is the toughest experience you had when flying? Well, when I was going across the Atlantic by myself the second time, um, there about two hours, two hours, clear skies, beautiful. I could see the moon and the stars. But within two hours, the weather started to get bad and it started to affect my engine. And so it's very tiring to be that aware the whole time and a little bit nervous. Um, it just, it wreaks havoc on your muscles because you're so tense. Um, so the, the, middle and second part of that trip, I had to land in a field um, because I got diverted from my original course, um, which that was much of a surprise to the, <laughs> the wonderful farmer. <laughs> he asked me where I'd come from. <laughs> and I told him, I told him that I came from America and it took him a while to believe me. Um, but yes, so it's more just the time, being alert, uh, and then sometimes the weather, you, you can't plan for that. Hmm. Well, you're certainly a, a brave pioneer in your field and very admirable. 
And I just want to thank you, Ms. Earhart, for taking the time from your busy life to speak with us in our audience here today. And good luck on your upcoming flight. My pleasure. My pleasure. I'll see you when I get back. Yes. All right. So uh, now we're going to transition to part three of our program in which we'll re-enter the 21st century and we'll meet uh, the woman who has brought Amelia Earhart to life for us to today. Amanda Hamilton Burkhart is lead educator here at the Watkins Museum and she is also the educational liaison for Freedom's Frontier National Heritage Area. So, so in, a, in a sense, like, like um, uh, Amelia Earhart, who she's honoring here today, she also leads a very busy, and you might say a pioneering life in her own way. Um, so Amanda, uh, I wonder if you could tell us about your own background and what you do at the Watkins Museum and at Freedom's Frontier. Absolutely, well, first of all, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity because this has been really fun. Um, I actually am from a theater background, so uh, I actually, I became um, quite in love with Amelia Earhart when my uh, godmother uh, played Amelia Earhart in a one-woman play down in Natchez in Kansas when I was nine, I think, <laughs> and so we went down to see it, and I remember just falling in love with her then, um, and then I was lucky enough last year to be offered the opportunity to play her. She was gifted to me from my friend, Mary, um, as uh, at, at uh, Old Shawnee Town, 1929, which I, rec I recommend you go visit. Mm -hmm. um, and so between my theater background and now my history museum involvement, uh, that's how this sort of came about. And it's been really, really fun. Um, but in general, uh, I at the museum, I always joke, I'm in charge of everyone below the age of 18. So I like to do family programming and build field trips. And our team is really, really wonderful. And we all work together really hard to create as many educational experiences as possible for as many people as possible. We do a lot of homeschool. And now everybody's homeschool. So <laughs> we've been doing a lot of that, which is really great. And then, um, yeah, it's just a wonderful, wonderful job where I get to interact with a lot of young learners and young historians, and it's really big fun. And what about um, Freedom's Frontier? Uh, what's your career like with that organization? Absolutely. Um, Freedom's Frontier is great because I feel my position is called uh, Education Liaison, and what that means really is I try and learn as much as I can about all of our 185 sites, and if you want to learn more about Amelia, you can go to her childhood home in Atchison. There's also the uh, Atchison Historical Society. There's the Kansas Historical Society and then World War I Museum. And those are just a handful of places that you can go to learn more about Amelia. Um, but with them, what I do is I work to assist any of the education teams at those sites with uh, ideas or support or partnerships with other sites um, to create as um, intensive of uh, an educational experience for their uh, institution as possible. And so just connecting them and helping them as best I can. Great. We actually have an audience question, which, which I think is a good one. Um, this is from Jen again. Uh, did your godmother perform Amelia at the Coterie? I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yes, and yes. remind me of her name. She says that she saw that production some time ago. Yes, Lisa Cordes. Great. Lisa Cordes, yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. That's wonderful. Uh-huh. Uh, why did you decide to portray Amelia Earhart? And what about her do you find interesting or inspiring? Um, I love the fact that, so you'll notice that I didn't talk a lot about her accomplishments because the truth is you can just look up a timeline. You know, those things, it's like in 1928, she flew across the Atlantic in 19, you know, and you can look all that stuff up. What I love about her the most is how she was, and especially in these times, she was an active, I don't even know if she would call herself a feminist though, honestly, but she was an active uh, soldier for equality. She was very, very determined to create an environment of education and learning and, uh, and, and even in her own journey, she ended up never finishing school but she went to multiple colleges and she would, and she was very adamant, especially when she was instructing at Purdue, she was very adamant about having the students 
really do what they were passionate about. I mean, she took engineering, medicine, poetry, literature, like she took a bunch of different languages. She took a bunch of different classes and she thought you really should build your own journey. And I really appreciate that. And I really, I've gone to a couple of different schools. I've kind of gone through a non-traditional path. I've had a couple of careers and all involving teaching, but, um, but yeah, and I just really appreciated that, that her, her love of an adventure was what the guiding, the guiding line. It wasn't aviation. It was, she wanted to see what things would do. You know, what would happen if I push this? What would happen if I do this? Let's try it. Let's do it. Let's see it. Let's, you know, let's build it. And I just really appreciate that personality trait of hers. That's great. Um, and actually, uh, that leads into my last question here. And feel free to spend some time um, on this because we, we do have some time le left yet. And I'm sure the audience would enjoy to hear hearing more about your uh, process of creating um, your portrayal of Amelia Earhart. So my question is, how did you research uh, her life? And maybe this is a chance as well to point people who are interested towards some other sources for reading. Great. And Thank you so much. Um, okay, so, well, um, not to bury the lead, uh, Will and I work directly together, so he knows that for the last about year, almost, I've been saying, oh, sorry, I was in Amelia land, because <laughs> it's like the more research you do about her, the more you find, and the more you find, because she was, she is infamous, and because she was famous, um, or is still so famous, she's probably probably one of the most famous aviators of our time, um, of all time. Uh, she, there's a lot. But what I did do specifically was I started with an overview documentary that I definitely recommend. Um, it's on, from the biography channel. You can find it online. Um, I'm just on, if you just Google it, uh, it's just Amelia Earhart and it's like 47 minutes and it's an overview of her life. So that was just to bone up on an overview of her life. So I had basic uh, jumping off points. Then I went the exact opposite direction from an overview. I, I got all of her books, the ones she's written. So I was reading her voice because that was very important to me in portraying her is that I didn't have too many biographers ideas of who she was, but I just actually had verbatim who she was written in words. Um, so I read her books. I read a bunch of her letters um a bunch of her correspondence i listened to some of her speeches that were recorded uh i i wanted to try and do her voice but i didn't want to do her injustice so if you if you do ever want to listen to her speak she's incredibly well spoken and incredibly intelligent um as far as there are a couple of speeches that are quite beautiful to listen to um she was she was she was an avid reader i think she used books to sort of fill the void of not having a lot of friends because she moved so much. But that being said, <laughs> there was no lack of charm. She apparently charmed every single person she met. Um, they loved her. Uh, she drank buttermilk avidly. So apparently at Purdue, the, <laughs> the consumption of buttermilk went up like 100% when she moved in because all of the girls were trying to mimic her personality, which I just thought was beautiful. Um, but yeah, so I, I really just, I always try and go primary source. So I wanted to see what she had to say. And I recommend reading, the books will be both listed. I recommend reading uh, her writing because she's brilliant. And um, then there's also a podcast that I ended up listening to later on that I think we're going to play a clip from at some point. It's called Chasing Earhart, and it's a podcast that's built around a group of people who love Amelia Earhart, and they're also creating a documentary. And there's a trailer for the documentary, but also I recommend you listen to the podcast because it's a lot of really cool interviews with people from all the way from like an author who wrote a book about feminism and Amelia Earhart 20 years ago to a 17 year old girl who did a history day project on her. So it's just like all of these different people and why they love Amelia and their version of Amelia and sort of, and 
what I try to steer away from very much so, and this is a direct uh, nod to Muriel, is Muriel got really mad at the end because she was so frustrated with everyone focusing on what happened to Amelia, which is not the point of her story. The point of her story is the amazing accomplishment she made. And so Muriel was very frustrated with the, ooh, where is she? Oh, she's, she disappeared. Oh, who knows what happened? And so I really tried to pay a lot of attention to her story while she was alive. And that's why we dated it to the day that she left for that trip, because I didn't want it to be about why she disappeared. There's plenty of theories on that. And if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to talk about that. I know all of the theories, but, um, but yeah, it's not always, I don't think it's as important as who she was as a woman and as a feminist and as a scientist. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, since you offered, um, we do have a, qu a question from an audience member about that. There are many theories about what happened on Amelia's final flight. Um, in your opinion, after doing research on her, what do you think most likely happened? Okay, well, there are three main theories that I see as the most likely and that scientists see as the most likely. So there is the theory that she just went down in the ocean and they found pieces of what they think is the Lockheed Electra in the ocean. Um, and uh, one of the things that I, that is interesting um, that I don't admit when, uh, when I am being her is she was dead tired. She was tired. She hadn't learned the Morse code properly. She hadn't learned how to use her radio properly because she was so busy that she didn't, she actually didn't have as many flying hours as most of her contemporaries because she was so busy doing speeches or giving, giving talks and doing all of this stuff. So she was really, really tired. Um, and she, there are some letters, some correspondence between her and her husband where he actually told her to come back because she made it all but almost 7% of the way. Like she was almost back to California when they went down. So, so she was tired and she was underprepared, unfortunately, but she just wanted to go. She wanted it to happen. Um, so that's frustrating. So it's possible that she just went down. It's also possible that she didn't understand how to work the radio properly. So she couldn't find where she was supposed to land. There's a lot of recording of her talking and they can hear her, but she can't hear them. And I actually, on this podcast, there's an interview with uh, one of the radio uh, men from the ground talking about how she was kind of, she was kind of frustrating. Like she would just turn it off because she would get annoyed with what they were saying. Mm. So she was definitely um, opinionated to say the least. <laughs> um, but, you know, she was very sure of herself. And, and Muriel talks about that. Amelia never... Amelia never really questioned whether or not she could do something. She was sort of quiet, and but that was more just her being reserved. She always knew she could do everything, which I think is beautiful. Um, but yeah, so the three main theories are either she went just down in the ocean, she and Fred Noonan went down. Um, either there is a small island where she was supposed to land where they have found what looked like uh, there's an archaeological program right now that's working on this that's found what looked like a makeshift campsite. They think that she, and this is also on that podcast, she, they tried to anchor the boat at this island, but then the tide came in and boat, and, or the, the boat, the, sh uh, the airplane ended up floating out. So they had no way to like get back and so they just ended up stranded on this island. Mm -hmm. And then there is the third theory which people think that she became a prisoner of war. Um, and there was this whole sort of, I don't really believe this theory, but there's this whole idea that either they had scheduled for her to do some sort of like spy work for FDR because she was friends with uh, Franklin Roosevelt and Eleanor. Eleanor and she were really close actually. She wanted to teach Eleanor how to fly, but Franklin wouldn't let her. Um, but that maybe she, uh, she ended up getting captured by the Japanese and becoming a pawn and a prisoner of war and ended up uh, dying. And there are people who say first person accounts. So there's a lot of ideas of what happened, um, but 
once again, I try to not make that my focus, but it is very interesting information for sure. Yeah. But as you indicated, uh, the disappearance is, is almost, you know, the least interesting thing of her amazing career. That's how I feel. But I mean, it's, of course, everyone loves a mystery, you know, and it, it romanticizes her in a way that who knows if she would still be as famous today if she hadn't disappeared, you know, maybe, maybe she would just be an 80 year old woman <laughs> who <laughs> was, who flew once, like, you know, like, I don't know, but I, I, yeah. Well, as you've indicated, Amanda, she definitely is, is worthy of being famous and uh, of worth remembering for all of her varied accomplishments. And um, we're, of course, here in Kansas, we're, we're honored to claim her as one of our own. So that's very exciting. So thank you very much, Amanda Hamilton Burkhart, my colleague and, and portrayer of, of Amelia Earhart today. And uh, thank you to everyone for joining us today for this program. We ask that you follow the Watkins Museum and Freedom's Frontier on social media to learn about new portals to the path, past events happening each month. So thanks again and uh, goodbye for now. To the degree that a superhero is defined as someone who does things ordinary human beings can't or won't do, and someone who inspires ordinary human beings to greatness, Amelia fits both of those perfectly. I saw the moon and stars most of the night. To the degree that a superhero is defined as someone who does things ordinary human beings can't or won't do, and someone who inspires ordinary human beings to greatness, Amelia fits both of those perfectly. I saw the moon and stars most of the night. Of course, in both flights, I was very glad to see land. She really is part of the American lore. You can go around the world and even for people who don't speak English. And if you say Amelia Earhart, they know who you're talking about. She faced a lot of things that we don't face, and the reason we don't face them today is because she did it for us. I can't help feeling my flight meant little to aviation, but if it means something to women, then I feel it justified. The most effective way to do it is to do it, right? Not everybody puts their life on the line to accomplish a dream, and Amelia did. The whole of America is proud of you and your performance. Roaring into the Oakland airport, she brings to a triumphant finish her 2,400-mile hop from Hawaii after 18 hours in the air. You're either inspired by Amelia's life, or you're inspired by the mystery of Amelia's disappearance. Nobody will acknowledge the evidence I do have, and they won't let me look for more, and that is a cover-up. The disappearance of Amelia Earhart, one of America's biggest mysteries, may finally be solved. Amelia Earhart, on a globe-girdling flight with navigator Fred Noonan, took off for a hop over trackless ocean wastes and was never heard from again. Now this photograph, unearthed by history investigators from the National Archives, appears to show Earhart and Fred Noonan, her navigator, on the dock in the Marshall Islands. I am not a mystery woman. I am not a media air hawk. There didn't seem to be anything to look like an airplane. I just feel that she went down at sea. What could have happened had that flight succeeded? It's fun to try to think what happened. Amelia survived to a very old age. All we have to do is leave. And Amelia Earhart left like nobody else. If you have a real dream, you should follow it. Her spirit is around us. I only know one truth. It's time for my story to end.